Okay, so let's continue our discussion of nitrogen mustard drugs. Okay, so we want to see then now how they are going to bind to DNA. We want to see what the effect of that on a cell is. And I want to stress that these drugs are not selective. They will not find cancer cells and selectively work on cancer cells. They will uh, do this in any cell that they go into. So they are incredibly cytotoxic drugs. Uh, they do however affect cancer cells more. The only reason is though that cancer cells are rapidly dividing and therefore the things that these drugs do are more harmful to cells that are rapidly dividing. And that's why uh, the side effects uh, that you get when um, you take anti-cancer chemotherapy such as losing your hair uh, it's uh, basically affecting cells in the body which are naturally dividing very fast. So there are some cells that are meant to be dividing very fast. Cancer cells are not meant to be dividing very fast. They do, but it's pathological. Uh, but there are cells in your body that are meant to be dividing very fast, such as the uh, cells which are making your hair. And... Um, also the cells that lie in your gut and lie in your uh, nasal epithelium, things like this. Um, all of these are dividing very fast and when you take these anti-cancer chemotherapies it stops them from dividing very fast and that's why uh, you uh, suffer from these sort of side effects such as the famous one is losing your hair. Okay, right. So let's see how uh, nitrogen mustards work and we'll see it in the context of the nitrogen mustard simply because it's the simplest structure to draw and takes the least time. Okay, but they all have these chloroethyl groups and basically the mechanism is the same uh, in, all of that, in, all, in the case of all of them. Okay, so basically what's going to happen is this drug undergoes a reaction. Okay, so... Let's look at this nitrogen here. This nitrogen has a lone pair of electrons on it. Okay. Let's now look at the bond between the carbon and the chloride atom. There are two electrons in there. One electron is from the carbon and one electron is from the chloride. Okay. Now, what can happen is this carbon can choose to go and bind to this nitrogen atom instead, basically and give off a chloride anion. So basically what's going to happen is the chloride atom is going to take both of the electrons in this bond and it's going to go off and form a chloride anion. That's going to leave this carbon positively charged. Now, it, this the way this reaction occurs is the instant... Well, actually, the chloride anion comes off second. What's going to happen is the carbon is going to bind to this double bond on the nitrogen, and then the chloride is going to be chucked off afterwards. But basically, when the chloride is chucked off, it takes both of these electrons here in this bond. That's going to mean that this carbon would have a positive charge, but for the fact that it's bound to this nitrogen, uh, the lone pair of electrons on this nitrogen. So it's going to nick one of the electrons from the nitrogen, okay? Uh, and that will give it, that will make it neutral. Then it will use the electron that it's nicked out of this lone pair to then form a covalent bond with the nitrogen where it shares this nicked electron with this electron that the nitrogen has managed to maintain and therefore gets a sing single covalent bond between the two. And that means that now the nitrogen has the positive charge. So what it's going to form, basically, is if we draw this out, you'll have a very unstable ring. So you'll have these, this free-membered ring, like so. Okay, and these both have hydrogens off them here. Okay, so this is what you've got. The nitrogen now has a positive charge on it. This chloroethyl group is completely undisturbed by the reaction, so it's still over here, and the methyl group is also completely undisturbed. So I hope you understand what's happened there. This carbon here has gone and formed a bond with this nitrogen. It took one of the electrons out of this lone pair for its own, basically. That left this nitrogen with a positive charge, okay? Uh, the carbon doesn't gain a, neg a positive charge because it's given its electron up to the chlorides, which gains a negative charge. So it would have had a positive uh, 
sorry, would have had a positive charge, but for the fact that it's taken this electron off the nitrogen. It then uses that electron it's nicked to pair with this electron that the nicked electron was originally with in a covalent bond, which is this covalent bond here, and that leaves the nitrogen with a positive charge and the chloride atom with a negative charge. So this is an ammonium ion. Okay, and it's important to understand that what did not happen what did not happen first was that the, this is what not, didn't happen. The chloride atom did not just fall off and then the carbon bound there. No, the carbon bound there and then the chloride dropped off. And that's important to understand because now this ammonium ion is extremely unstable. And what's going to happen is it's going to form another structure. So this bond here between the nitrogen and the carbon will break and the nitrogen will take back both of its electrons, basically. So what you'll get forming instead is this uh, scenario where the positive charge is now on this carbon here. So this now has the positive charge here. And then you have this untouched chloroethyl group here. So this is what's known as the carbonium ion. So this is the carbonium ion. So the nitrogen mustard undergoes a reaction where it first becomes an ammonium ion and then it becomes a carbonium ion. And now this positive charge is on this carbon, this second carbon of this ethyl group, okay? And this is now an extremely reactive group here and it's going to attack DNA. So let's go on to another piece of paper and see how. Okay, right, so what's it going to do? So. We now need the structure of guanine to understand what it's going to do. I'll firstly just draw our carbonium ion out since we've moved a piece, a piece from a piece of paper. So here's our carbonium ion. So we've got, I'll draw it out in full so that you can understand where exactly the positive charge is. So we've got this ethyl group and then this carbon is missing an electron so it's positively charged. The chloride has its electron basically. And then we have the other chloroethyl group completely undisturbed here. So this is our carbonium ion. Okay, right. So what really, this is extremely reactive, by the way. This carbonium ion is not stable. So it really wants electrons. Okay, so now let's see the structure of the guanine organic base in DNA. So the guanine organic base is a purine. So it has a pyrimidine ring with an imidazole ring. So let me show you the structure of guanine. So a pyrimidine ring then first is a six-membered ring where you have four carbons in that six-membered ring and then two nitrogens. Okay, so the two nitrogens have a single carbon in between them like so. And you also have alternating double and single bonds. Now in the pure pyrimidine ring you would have a double bond there, but in uh, the case of guanine, it's been cleaved, basically. You've only got a single bond left there. Instead, you've got a carbonyl group coming off here. So you've got a double bond to an oxygen there, and this nitrogen has a hydrogen bound to it. Okay, but we still call it a pyrimidine ring, even though it hasn't actually got that double bond there. Okay, then off the side down here, you've got what's known as an imidazole ring. Okay, so you have these two nitrogens coming off here, and then the imidazole ring is a uh, five-membered ring. And what makes it an imidazole ring is that basically it has this double bond between this carbon and nitrogen. And a double bond between a carbon and a nitrogen atom is known as an imide bond. Okay, so that's why this whole ring is known as an imidazole ring. Okay, so the imidazole ring is just this five-membered ring here. So carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen, that's the imidazole ring. Okay, and it's bound basically to this uh, pyrimidine ring up here. Now the last thing to put on is that you have an amino group of that carbon there. Anything else? Uh, that's fine. This carbon here needs a hydrogen. And this nitrogen here is what will be bound to the ribose sugar. So this will be bound to the second carbon of the ribose sugar if I just draw... Right. Oh dear, no, what's happening here? That's gone terribly wrong. So here's our ribose sugar. Maybe I can rectify it. So there's the ribose sugar with the fifth carbon up there. Okay, and this 
first member of the uh, pentameric ring is then an oxygen. So this is the first carbon of the ribose sugar that this guanine is bound to. So this is the structure of the guanine organic base. So this is, and I don't want to write it where I'm about to show the reaction happening. This is guanine. Okay, and I've actually shown it drawn to ribose. So guanine bound to ribose is the nucleoside guanosine. Guan guanosine, yes. I was thinking guaniazine for a moment. No, guanosine. Right. Uh, so when you have organic bases bound to ribose sugars, that is something known as a nucleoside. And people are usually like, what the? What is a nucleoside? They've heard of what a nucleotide is, but what's a nucleoside? A nucleoside is basically just the nucleotide, but with no phosphate group bound to it. So a nucleotide would be the organic base plus the ribose plus phosphate groups up here. The nucleoside is just the organic base plus the ribose. Okay, right, so what's going to happen with our carbonium ion and this guanine uh, organic base? Well, basically, this really, really wants to find some electrons. And this nitrogen here, known as the N7, the seventh nitrogen, so this is N7 of guanine, okay? This has a beautiful lone pair of electrons here, okay? So what's going to come and happen is this carbonium ion is going to do exactly what it did to this nitrogen here, but to this nitrogen on guanine. So basically, it's going to nick one of those electrons off this nitrogen atom, okay? It's going to nick one of them off. And then what it's going to do is, in this horrible, vicious game on the nitrogen, it's then going to convince the nitrogen to form a covalent bond with it, where it uses the electron that it has nicked from the nitrogen to form this covalent bond. So it sort of nicks the, sneakily nicks the electron off the nitrogen, and then convinces the nitrogen that it's being a beautiful friend to the nitrogen, and that it's going to share this electron with it, but actually that electron is the electron that it's just nicked off it. Okay, so that's going to transfer the positive charge onto this N7 of the guanine because basically once the um, carbonium ion has nicked the electron, it gains a neutral charge and the positive charge goes onto this nitrogen. So, let's show this happening. What you're going to have, the overall result, is you'll have a positive charge here. You'll then have a covalent bond. Okay, so let me show this now as a covalent bond. Okay, in pink here. And then you'll have these two carbons here, which each have two hydrogens off them. So this is this ethyl group here. Okay. Then you have the nitrogen here. Then you have the chloroethyl group here. Okay, so this is the undisturbed chloroethyl group. And here's the methyl group sticking up here. So, this is how you alkylate DNA. You have stuck this great big alkyl group. So, this is an alkyl group. It's a hydrocarbon group. Okay, so this whole thing here. This is an alkyl group. So, we have stuck an alkyl group onto our guanine organic base within our DNA. And therefore, we have alkylated our DNA. But the story isn't going to stop there. Because look at this. This is exactly identical to that initial chloroethyl group we had. So it can go through the exact same thing. And it can bind to another guanine on maybe uh, the complementary strand or maybe the same strand. So you're going to get cross-links formed. And we'll discuss this further in the next video.